Well, good morning. Good morning. Glad to be back with you. Uh, if you've got some Bibles this morning, I'd like to turn to 1 John. 1 John, uh, just close to Revelation, but don't go all the way. And uh, look at 1 John this morning. We're going to look at uh, begin in chapter 1 and uh, proceed through chapter 2. Uh, Dr. Warren Wiersbe, who is a great commentator on Scripture, had once said that every form of life has a tendency. Well, even though you and I are at the top of the food chain, even though you and I have enjoyed that status for a long time, we have an enemy. This enemy is crafty. It's silent sometimes. It can destroy homes. It can ruin churches. It can topple governments. And I'm not even really talking about the devil, even though he is our enemy. But the enemy I want to talk about this morning is a three-letter word with I right in the middle of it, sin. Sin is our greatest enemy. And in fact, you'll see in the passage that we see here in just a minute that John speaks of sin nine times just in our passage alone. So sin is a serious subject. And so we as Christians ought to be serious about sin. And I know school is out, but we're going to take a test this morning. We're going to see whether our walk matches our talk. So read with me 1 John chapter number 1. If you're there, to say, beginning in verse number 5, the Bible says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, then we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Would you pray with us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come into your house, the privilege to open up your word, the privilege to sing songs of praise to you. God, just to love on you for a little moment. We pray that you would give me, give, give root to this scripture that we take in this morning. Lord, may it penetrate our hearts, may it penetrate our spirits, and Lord, as it is written in James, that we not be just hearers of the word, but God, we would be doers. Lord, as we begin to take this test, Lord, may we examine ourselves and see where we meet. And Lord, may we meet you in the end. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we ask all these things. Amen and amen. I want you to see three things this morning. One, we see the, the, the determination is what we'll get to in the very end. We're going to see a demonstration. We really see the declaration of John. John wrote in his gospel, the original gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, he wrote in chapter 20, verse 31, but these things are written that you might believe. So he wrote his gospel that you and I might really believe in the words and the life and the actions of Jesus Christ. Then when we find him in 1 John, his first epistle, that he's writing to believers, he's writing to Christians, he's writing with a different purpose. Where it was that he's no, writing that you might believe. I want you to look with me in verse number, uh, chapter 5, verse 13. I want you to see this. In chapter 5, verse 13, John says this. These things have I written unto you that believe. So it was originally for you to believe. Now it is those that believe on the name of the Son of God. That you may, what church? Know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So his purpose here, his declaration, is that this is the message in verse 5. Read it again. This is the message we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So John is sharing the gospel essentially. He's kind of partaking that or breaking that down, if you will, is a better word. He's unpacking it for us. For those that believe, he said, now I want you to know. We would call this the doctrine of assurance. We have the doctrine of security. In Baptist culture, we believe that once saved, what? 
always saved. That's the doctrine of security. That there's nothing that's going to pluck us out of the hand of God. Scripture tells us that. Can I will make one little change to that? I'd like to say once change, always change. That if you've truly been changed by God, if you've truly been converted by Him, if you've truly repented, then you'll be saved. If we just think we're saved, I like what Mark Lowry says. He said, I've woken up one morning, some mornings, and I have not felt saved. He said, I've looked in the mirror and I did not look saved. I'm thankful that our salvation is not based on my feelings. Amen? It's not based on how we get up in the morning and we feel about ourselves. We know. We have the security. But so now this morning we're going to look at the assurance that we know that we are saved. Furthermore, John writes in verse number 2, or verse number 1 of chapter 2, he says, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. I love that when we, we talk about, we've come, and I think I used this a couple weeks ago when I was here, the first verse of Scripture that we seem to use with new Christians is, oh, just remember when you, you mess up, that if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful unto us. But we ought to preach to them, let not sin reign in your mortal body. That's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. And we ought to write here, but we remember that John wrote that you sin not. He's trying to encourage believers like you and I that we would live a life less of sin. Get rid of the sin. We'll unpack that a little bit more in just a little bit. But I want you to see here that this knowing, this assurance that you and I have, we're going to take the test here in just a little bit. This assurance that we have, it's not because a preacher told you that you were saved. And it can't even be because you feel that you were saved. I don't want anyone to doubt their salvation this morning. I want everyone to walk out this door that's saved and go, I know that I know that I know that I know. And so we take this test that we'll take here just a little bit. But it has to be that we test ourselves on God's word. It cannot be that one time I repented. It has to be continual repentance. It cannot be one time I believe. It has to be continual belief. And it can't be at one time I walk. We have to continue to walk. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul writes and he encourages the believers to examine yourselves. So the declaration is this, that Paul, John is encouraging his audience to test themselves, to examine themselves. Well, who gives John the authority to tell you and I, Brother Mark, that we need to test ourselves? We'll look back there in verse number 5 again. This is the message. Which we have heard of who? Him. Who's that him, that church? That'd be Jesus. John has the authority to speak to you about us living a life that is getting rid of sin, that putting those things aside because he walked with the very one that walked on water. He was, was the partook and the one that parted the Red Sea. He was the, there with the one that illuminated the world, the light of the world. We'll get into that in just a minute too. John says, I walk with Christ so I can encourage you to live a life that is like Christ. We call that sanctification in, in, in Bible culture. We're justified when we come to acceptance of Jesus Christ. Now we are sanctified that we try to live each and every day more and more and more like Jesus. I long for a day where Baptists begin to live more like Jesus. Where the church begins to act and think and do more like Jesus and less about themselves. But it would be a little ridiculous here if John was just to give us this uh, declaration and then tell us well, then down to determine it for yourselves. There's got to be something that we measure up to. There's got to be a, a mark here. And, and when we take a test in school, there's got a certain mark that you've got to get in order to pass, right? They're not just going to let you get one question right and be like, well, let's move along. There's a certain benchmark there. There's got to be a standard. We want to know that you know. And so there has to be a demonstration of who we should ascribe for. Now, the next thing we notice in verse number 5 is that this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God is the focus here. He's now testing ourselves against God. Now, we and I, you and I both know that if we just have to test ourselves against God, we're going to fail every time. We'll never measure up to God's grace. We'll never measure up to God's glory. But thankfully, we don't have to. Because if it was up to our best day, our, our most 
you know, wonderful, righteous, self-glorifying day, we would never make it to heaven. But thankfully, it's through Jesus we get that bridge into God. So when the veil tore, and when Jesus was on the cross and the veil tore that afternoon, it wasn't so that God could get out, it was so you and I could get in. Jesus was that bridge for us. And so now we see that the determinant or the demonstration is that God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Now let's take this and apply this a little bit for this moment. In this room, we've got lights on, right? Is there any darkness in this room right now, though? No? Look under the pew. It's a little darker under there, isn't it? Why? There's no light in there. There's something that is blocking the light from getting there. It's a shadow. Now we say the light's still going under there because we can still see there. It's not pitch black. But, but think about this. With you and I, even though on our best day, we may shine like the bright light. We may look like everything. There's still a little bit of darkness in us. Because we're human. It's part of our nature. But God is so perfect. He is so holy that He is all light and there is not a speck of darkness within you. And then it was even said about Jesus, the light of the world, that he was the lamb without spot or without blemish. There is nothing imperfect about God. There is nothing imperfect about Jesus Christ. And again, if we were to measure ourselves up to that standard, we're going to fall short. Anybody perfect in here? No? I, I went up to see my, my relatives this weekend, and I was sitting there talking to my grandmother out on the front porch. She was talking about that she wasn't perfect. I don't even know how we got on to it. She said, none of my six kids are perfect. None of my grandkids are perfect. And I looked at her and said, well, my mom, I'm pretty close. And she just began to that kind of look, you know, that, that older people, she just kind of looked at me. I remember one time I had walked in, we're talking about sin here. And she said, it's time to go to church. I said, oh, it's all right, mom. I don't have to go. I didn't sin this week. It's quick. Is that back the hand on the back of my head, Brother Mark? It's quick as everything. Dragging me after that. But we're not perfect. It will never be. But we can see that God is light and in Him is no darkness. And I'm going to jump to this a little bit because we're going to come back to it. Now look with me in verse number in chapter 2. My little children, these things write on you that you sin not. So John's saying you're not going to be perfect. I want you to try to be. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You realize when you and I have fallen short, when we mess up, we are bought by the blood, we are purchased by that price, He has been applied to our standards, and even if we mess up today, Brother Mark, we can go and get in this altar, we can pray, we can be in our quiet place, and God's going, He's got sin, I ain't going to hear Him. And that prayer comes up before God, and Jesus sitting at the right hand goes, uh, Daddy, that's what we need to listen to. He's one of ours. I, he's bought with my blood. He's been taken care of. We need to listen to this prayer. He's trying to get back in track. He's trying to get fellowship with us again. We need to listen to that prayer. I'm thankful, Brother Mark, that I've got an advocate in heaven. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and He's making intercession for me, and He's making intercession for you. Kind of tells me that we've got somebody on the other side that's rooting for us. Amen? He's there rooting for us. He's done all the hard work for us. But now he's wanting us to, to step in and be like him. So now we've got to get into the determination. So this is where we're going to stay for a little bit. The declaration is that John says, I want you to not sin. I want you to live a life. I want you to know what you know what you know. Take this test. So now we see the, the demonstration is that God is the standard that we're going to match up with, but now we've got to have the determination. I always hated the determination, Brother Mark. Grew up with my grandparents. I was, pretty much was raised by my grandmother. And she would tell me to go clean my room or brush your teeth, whatever it was. We'll go brush your teeth. Go brush your teeth. Okay. She come back a little bit. Did you brush your teeth? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Did they ever take our words for that? Nope. What did you have to do? Open your mouth. Mm -mm. Open your mouth. I brush my teeth. I'm good to go. 
No, she was going to determine for herself whether or not I had brushed my teeth at that point in time. She was going to determine whether I met her test, whether I passed it. She told me to go do this. I said I had done it, but now it's time to let the rubber hit the road. And so you're going to see several times here that John writes, if we say, so we're going to talk a lot. We're going to talk this talk. We're going to profess to be Christian. We're going to talk this big game. And John's saying, well, if you're going to say that, then this must be true. So we're going to take this test this morning. And hopefully at the end, where everyone's going to pass, and we'll see that everything's wonderful, and we'll move out of here, and everything will be glorious. But if not, we'll get to it at the end. But thankfully, you have that attitude. You have that person that we can confess to in Jesus. So let's read through it again. In verse number 6, we see that John writes for the first time, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So John is saying, if you proclaim to be a Christian, if you say, I walk hand in hand with God, but yet you walk in darkness, it's a lie. Now don't go home today and say, Brother John called me a liar. I didn't call you a liar, but the Bible did. You get mad at the other John. He's long dead. He's sitting up in heaven right now. He doesn't care what you call him. But he says here, if we say, if we profess, if we talk, that we have fellowship with him, but our walk is different than what our talk is, then we lie and we do not the truth. Have you ever met anybody that talked one way and walked another? They said one thing, but then they did another. Let's go back to that just a minute ago. I told my grandmother that I had brushed my teeth. I was talking that talk, brother boy. I was, I was, yep, I did. But I didn't walk the walk. And so that's what we're determining here this morning, of whether or not our walk matches our talk. So then we go to verse number seven. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, so if we go back to that demonstration, God is the light. God is the perfect example. If we say that we walk in fellowship with him, if we are in that light, we have fellowship with him. If we're truly there, we have fellowship with him and with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. In Psalm chapter number 51, David writes his, his wonderful lament. I believe if you saw the Hebrew manuscript, it would be covered with the tears of David. He writes in there, cleanse me, wash me, Oh, God, I've, I've sinned against you. This was after he and Bathsheba had had their little affair. And that's another sermon in itself. I could tell you that it's Bathsheba's fault, but we'll save that one for another day. But David messes up. David sins, and he acknowledges his transgressions against God. He says, I want you to wash me. I want you to cleanse me. Now, you ladies here that get to wash clothes and do all that, I've washed clothes myself. I don't want y'all to think that I don't wash my own clothes. But if you were to take home your nice, your nice white jacket right there, would you take that home today and pour ketchup in the washing machine? Yeah. That's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? But I want you to see that the blood, we would never, you'd never pour blood in there to clean up either. You might pour something in there to get rid of some blood. But we are washed clean by something that in us is dirty. We get blood on us. We're like, ugh. You gotta get that off. We'll clean that up. But you and I are made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. We can walk through filthy and dirty and ragged. We can walk through the blood of Christ and come out shining on the other side. It's almost like a car wash. You just kind of make your way through. The blood of Jesus Christ. So again, Paul, as John writes in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, so it's not enough to just say that we have fellowship with him and live another life. But it's another thing to say that we're so perfect that we don't even sin. Can I confess to you that I sin? And you sin too, if you'll be honest with yourselves. We all sin. We all fall short. We all have problems. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in. I want you to notice three things before I move on with this. One, I want you to understand about sin. You cannot cover up your sin. After David and Bathsheba had their little affair, David thought he could cover up the sin. If we read through the Bible history, David covers up his sin for about a year. 
You know all the things he tried to do. He tried to get Uriah to, to have a little drink and then and, you know, lay with his wife and try to cover it up that way. Well, that didn't work, so Uriah is sent to the front. Everybody else gets pulled back. Uriah dies on the battlefield. Maybe that'll cover it. And about a year goes by that we think it, and David is able to cover up his sin. And then in 2 Samuel chapter number 12, a prophet by the name of Nathan comes in. He begins to tell a story to King David. He said, King, I want you to think about this, and I'm going to tell you this, and I want you to get your reaction. He said there were two families. One was very rich, and one was very poor. The poor family had a little ewe lamb, and it was, it was like one of their own children. It stayed in the house with them. It slept in the bed. It ate their food off of the table. And the rich family, they had a ewe lamb, but it, it stayed out of the pasture. It did its own thing, and they didn't care for it any more than they cared for anything else. Well, this rich family had a long-lost relative that came to visit, and they decided to throw a party. But instead of sacrificing their own, the king, or, or this rich man, sent out his servant to go get this other man's little ewe lamb. The one that it was in their home. It was with them every day, every night. It was almost like their own family. And at this point, David is outraged that this, this rich man would come into another man's home, take his possession, and then try to do away with it. And Nathan had the courage to point him right in the, in the face, I believe, and he said, buddy, that's you. The Bible says, be sure that your sin will find you. You cannot cover up your sin. It's impossible. If, if I had a a, a stain on my shirt right here. I could cover it up. I could keep my jacket tight. And you'd never see it. But I can't cover up my sin. And see, here's the problem. When we, we try to cover up our sin, and the Bible keeps saying here that we lie, that we lie, that we lie. What's the problem with lying, church? If I lie one time, how many lies do I have to tell to cover up that one? Oh, man. It goes downhill from there. And so we can, but then here's the, the sad part about it. We begin to believe the very lies that we're telling people. And so if we tell people, oh yes, I'm a Christian, I, I walk with God, I do all of these things, but yet we don't meet up with His standards, then we're just lying. And then we begin to believe all of these other things. And I know that it's true because it, the, the Bible says, and Jesus talks about, in the end times, in the last days, there will be many that come before me saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things for you? Didn't we prophesy in thy name? Didn't we give out this cup of cold water? Didn't we do this? We fed the poor. We, went to, we had Bible stu uh, study. We put on Bible school. We went on mission trips. We did all of those things. And he just looks at it and says, apart from me, I never knew you said you were part of me, but you weren't. And while we can't cover up sin, I want you to see the beauty of verse number 9. We can't confess our sin. Verse number 9. But if we confess our sins, He, Jesus, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I got bopped on the back of my head if I didn't brush my teeth. But God forgives me of my sins if I just confess them to Him. If I just say, God, I've messed up. I know I have. But thankful through your advocate, through the propitiation of our sins, the washing away, the doing away, by the blood of Jesus, I can say, I've messed up. And God, I want to get right. We can confess our sins. And if we do that, we can't cover them, we can't confess them, but if we do that, we can conquer sin. See, when Jesus was on the cross, I told you the veil was torn open. We no longer needed to make the Old Testament sacrifices. We no longer needed to get a lamb together and sacrifice it. We no longer had to go into the Holy of Holies on that one day, the Day of Atonement, to make sacrifice for the entire nation. Jesus Christ Himself provided the sacrifice. No longer do we need those things. And I believe, I will believe this until somebody tells me otherwise. 
that when Jesus was on the cross and then he was laid in the bar tomb, he went into the gates of hell himself and he grabbed the keys of hell and death out of Satan's hand and walked out of there triumphantly. And the Bible says, Of death, where is thy sting? Sin, is where is thy victory? We can conquer sin. It may not be in this mortal body because we're going to still sin up until the day we die. Even as great as Billy Graham was, he sinned until the day he died. But he's conquered sin now. Because it's washed away and he's walked into the presence of God. He's conquered sin. When Paul writes, I believe it's in Romans chapter number 8, he said, I am persuaded. They neither height nor depth in all these things. No spirits, no demons, no principalities. Height, depth, darkness, whatever it is. Freight truck, you know, potato picker, all those things. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But the very beginning of that, he says we are more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors because we love God. So we've had the declaration that that John's saying, I want you to sin not. I want you to know that you know what you know. The demonstration is that God is the ultimate demonstration. The determination is whether or not we're there. So I ask you this morning, does your walk match up with your talk? You say that you're a Christian, but your life really doesn't reflect it. Confess that sin. Get right with God. Get back in fellowship with Him. Do we say that we're one thing? Confess it. Get back with Him. Remember, it's not I repented once. It's continual repentance. It's not I believe once. It's I continually to believe. And it's not just a one-time walk. It's an everyday walk. Jesus looks at the disciples in, in, in Mark's Gospel. He says, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. And I love the word that's added in Mark's Gospel. He so said, I want you to take up your cross daily and follow me. It's not a Sunday morning thing. It's not a Wednesday night thing. It's taking up our cross and walking the walk every day. I want you to determine this morning if that is true for you. Does your talk match your walk? Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning. Lord, that we can open up your word and God, we can glean understanding from it. God, I pray in this time of invitation, Lord, if there's one that's lost, Lord, that they, they're not assured, they have no security. God, I pray that they would get in this altar. And they, Lord, they would confess their sins to you. They would believe that you died on the cross for them. And God, they would rise a new creation in your kingdom. God, maybe those, there are those here that maybe their walk just doesn't really match up with their talk. God, I pray that you would convict them of those sins. And Lord, they would get in the altar to you. Get in some quiet place that Confess those sins, knowing that if we'll confess them, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our unrighteousness and cleanse us of those sins. God, in whatever we it is done, we pray that you receive all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we ask all these things.